In a world where 99% of people are desperately trying to fit in, the 1% understand that success is found when you stand out from the crowd. I'm Jack Henderson, and this is the Flamingo Sundays podcast. If you're looking for the 99%, you're in the wrong place. This week on Flamingo Sundays, we've got Mark Kentwell. Now, Mark is a founder, advisor, and entrepreneur, and has started or helped build more than eight companies, with the majority of them reaching sector-leading positions. Now, Mark is the co-founder of PRD Newcastle, Lake Macquarie, and Central Coast Group, which is a collection of real estate offices ranked in the top 10 real estate businesses in Australia. Mark has been named the Australian Principal of the Year more than three times, as well as an industry thought leader, also more than three times. Mark is an investor in the Pi Lab Real Estate Industry Venture Capital Fund, and he is also a board member of that same fund and has been since the inception in 2017. Mark is also the co-founder of one of Australia's fastest growing buyers advocacies, of which I am the other co-founder, Henderson Advocacy, and his newest business, Nexa, is helping real estate businesses scale beyond what they are right now. Mark Kentwell, Ryan Holiday says, how to stay calm while everyone else freaks out. Separate things into what you can control and what you don't. Focus on the smallest things you can do right now. Examine the costs of panicking or emotional reaction and have confidence in your ability to make the best of anything. What comes to mind when you hear that? Uh, I'm a massive fan of Ryan Holiday's uh, capture of the essence of the stoicism from 2000 or so years ago and then putting it into everyday life. So I I read the Daily Stoic every day. Those lessons are so tied in my mind and getting better. What comes to mind when I hear that is that that we're always going to have a billion more external things going on that we can't control. And if we attach ourselves to those, straight away puts things outside of our belief that we can handle it. And sometimes we think we can go down that path and deal with it, but it's wasted resources and energy. So look, that's a great principle. And I I would say to a large extent, I like to live by that as much as possible. And why is that? Well, you know, this is something that's changed for me over time. I, I think, you know, to use the term, I don't want to try and boil the ocean. <laughs> so if I take uh, control of my own reason, choice, and you know what's important to me in the first place with my vision, my values, my personal mission, and then how that translates to all the businesses, there's enough work to do on that anyway. And if I'm moving the ball forward on that, there's going to be people and things that are within that sphere, either directly or in- indirectly, are going to sort of show feedback from that. That if I'm out there worrying about all the other stuff buzzing on, all I'm doing is I'm saying to myself that that's more important than the things I've said are important, which would have me questioning if what I'm even talking about is important. Mm. And that sort of spiral is very draining. And naturally, you're early 40s now, there's been a lot of water under the bridge. Um, I'm assuming teenage Mark probably would have answered this a little bit differently. Yeah, look, teenage Mark, whilst... um, Interesting, I I have reflected on this a lot in later life as far as, you know, is the soul already mature and that drives the whole person? Because at each stage of my life, I've always had a sort of fundamental belief that I've got an awareness about things and how they work, but there just hasn't been the exposure, you know, in this existence of every one of those situations. So I've had less chance to try things on for size. And, you know, less of the readings and teachings and podcasts and books and mentors to help me with that. So the, the teenage Mark uh, would have been looking at a smaller circle of people anyway, especially pre-social media. But I, I would have been looking at what's the loudest noise? What's the, you know, where's the bushfire burning? And go to that bushfire and see how I can address it so that I don't have to deal with the discomfort of that bushfire that's over there that could come my way. Now I'd be look, looking at what am I doing that's contributing to this, if anything, what have I still got to get on with that's important to me and my vision and my values and my mission, and what's the next step I can take so that I can feel like I'm still moving ahead. And if that mm. bushfire starts to come into a radius where I've now got control over it, or at least have influence on the parties or situations that might dampen that, then great put it within the mix, but then it still needs to be assessed in the big rock philosophy. 
is it a big rock? Is it a pebble? Is it a grain of sand or is it the water that gets poured in on top? And, you know, to a large extent, a lot of the noise that goes on in the environment around all of us is actually barely even the vapor from water. Mm. And, it's, and it just doesn't sit anywhere near the spectrum of a big rock. I think it's the imagined concern about what could play out if that bushfire turns into a raging inferno and, and sort of takes out the whole town around you. And that's anxiety. That's the definition of it. Imagining an unsuccessful outcome of something that hasn't happened yet. So I'd rather look at the present moment. What am I doing in the present moment to move towards an outcome that I've chosen? And the steps along that way might need correcting from time to time, but I'd rather be spending energy on that. Did you, uh, did you read the Daily Stoic yesterday? Yeah, I, um, I, I put a page in each day. Sometimes I go a couple of pages ahead <clears throat> so that I don't end up uh, sort of like if I've got a super early get up or I've got a routine to do. So I'm, I think I'm, I started in 2017 and I've done on average a page a day since 2017. So I'm sort of five, five or six loops through it now. The, uh, the, the, the metaphor around the bushfire that you just, you just spoke about was in the Daily Stoic yesterday. It was around. Well, I've read it. It was around, <laughs> uh, it wasn't a bushfire reference, but it was a similar, a similar thing. You know, Ryan speaks about how the majority of us live in fear and create stories in our heads that 99.9% .9 of the time never come to mm. you know, fruition. And often what happens is when we live in that state of you know, paranoia, what if this person does that? What if that person does it? What if this happens? We often create those things because we're living in a fear of them actually happening. So mm. our actions on a day-to-day -day basis then actually influence those things having more of a chance of happening than if we were to just go, it's a stupid thought and I should just get on with uh, with my life. 100% agree with that. There's, you know, there's the belief triangle, form a belief, go looking for evidence, find the evidence, reaffirm the belief. There's confirmation bias. Uh, there's the fact that the, the brain can't process the negative. So if I say, don't think of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, whatever you do, don't think of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, you, you're thinking of it, right? So like your mind just sees that image or the hearing of the sounds or the experience and you're moving towards it. So that's where, you know, having reflections on goals on a regular basis, having sort of a purpose, a mission, a uh, just cause like Simon Sodek talks about, helps a lot because then if you find yourself in a bit of a tiz and you look at all your biochemistry and you look at, you know, what you're doing and how stressed you are and why, and then you can have a look back at, well, how many of the actions that are contributing to this stress are actually related to me moving ahead on that? And it doesn't mean you're not going to get unanticipated things, but you more respond to them rather than react to them all the time. You don't want to be in that triggered sort of, sympathetic nervous state the fight flight or freeze mentality mm. the the area in which you grew up you, you moved around a lot when you were younger i think you said you, you moved once every year for a, about once a year for, yeah. for quite a long period of time and then happened to settle in around lake macquarie newcastle and um that's obviously how, how we become to know each other and become partners uh newcastle is very different today to what it was you know 20 odd years ago, right? It was mm. known as a country town, a regional town. Now it's very much a city, um, populations larger. The, the, the circle that you spoke about earlier in which you probably were surrounded by is probably a little bit different. Mm. Um, what was it like growing up in a, in a place like Newcastle where, you know, the mentality may have been more of a small country town mentality as opposed to a, you know, a big city mm. mentality? Yeah, well, in that time, I was born in a place called Holbrook, which is like 1,100 or so population. I think I was the only kid born in the hospital that week or that month from memory. <laughs> to the, uh, and that was just because they evacuated the hospital. <laughs> they probably like, did, Fuck. yeah. Trauma. <laughs> uh, and then in the Hills District, Sydney, then Lake Macquarie, and then that one house per year situation was my parents were sort of using the, their hands to renovate and flip those properties to help support the family and, you know, the recession that we were in for the bulk of the 90s in Australia. The recession we had to have so i suppose what was it like well i suppose the radius of awareness particularly pre-media like pre-social media my experience was that that i could see feel and know about i was probably more traveled than others but i wouldn't be picking up the phone on a landline on a regular basis calling a friend that i had from perth when we lived there for a year or whatever it may be so a lot of those moves were in the same suburb some of them were changing schools to answer your question about small town, uh, I think I experienced that to uh, quite a bit when I was in my teen years and I went up, uh, we lived up around the mainland region for a while. Um, there was rationale to do with jobs and schools and stuff like that that got us up there. 
and I, I really sort of felt that quite a bit there. But I, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was heavily affected by it. I just went, well, this is my environment. Mm. You know, it's sort of like, um, if you've ever heard of the Siamese fighting fish, have you heard yeah. of those? They're those ones with the beautiful colours you see in pet stores. Do you know why they have the colours? No idea. So it's actually to scare off their opponent. And only the males have that amount of colour. Because in the, in the back in the days when they called it Siam, that group of that body of land or islands or whatever it is, uh, there would be wet seasons where the water's deep. And then in the dry season, it would turn into puddles. And in those puddles, if there was two males in there, the, the puddle would only have enough food and and ability to reproduce for probably one male in most cases. So they would flare up <laughs> and, and do that. So, you know, that environment for that Siamese fighting fish is all that fish is known. So it's just normal behavior. Oh, there's another male, I need to beat the male. Or, you know, this is a small amount of water, I'm going to deal with it. If you took them out and put them in a massive tank in some luxurious place with the pH tested every day, that would be a whole new experience, which I think has opened up a more, more in these days when you've got, you know, countries that were definitely third world now accessing technology and being some of the best at it because of their commitment and you know the natural traits that they've got to help them move forward that that contrast wasn't really available then i only had my experiences and the stories that were told to me mostly by family mm. so I, I don't feel that during that period I, I felt restricted or that i was aware of other people that could get ahead quicker in business i think i harnessed it you know when i left the engineering and trades fields and went into real estate. I'd leveraged any network that I had. I, uh, I, I aimed to maintain as many of the circles that I had and friendships and connections. And I think it was helpful for me because I rose a lot quicker than the norm, like substantially quicker than the norm. And I was young and I was committed. Uh, it was probably helpful for me to an extent. But then it became more apparent that, you know, some of the people that had been there for a fair while and doing it pretty easy, sort of like taxi drivers before Uber came along, they didn't really have a reason to pivot or adapt. But when they see others coming through that are rising quicker with different thinking that didn't come from real estate, I suppose there's a, there's a lot of patting you on the back. But then when it gets a little bit further from you, that can turn into a target. Mm. Uh, and, and, and I don't hate on people that have got that kind of hate or mentality because it's their lack of awareness that's got them there. But I, I'd say I was probably more uh, willing to be affected by it early on because I just hadn't had as much exposure to the stoicism, to NLP, to personal and business coaching and to other high performance individuals of any kind, of many kinds. So yeah, I, I think that that small town mentality was probably around me, but you know, without as much city exposure or international exposure, then it was uh, harder for me to know that that was the environment. And reflecting back on it now, you, you feel like you're potentially more aware of that, that if you were in a different environment, you may have thought yeah, well, I, I'm definitely aware that there's idiosyncrasies about different areas. I think that on the, on the balance, it actually all levels out. Mm. I, I actually do have uh, a belief that in areas where you're in the big city and there's not as much small town mentality, that can be a, a blessing and a curse because those that are looking to grow quickly are possibly more likely to take shortcuts. They're, they're possibly more likely to hold a belief that they don't care what anyone else thinks. Now, I, I would say let's not care about what people think that have totally converging views, values, directions, how they show up as humans. But the, it can be useful to have that kind of noise, that chatter that comes from, to use the word, you know, cut down the tall poppy or small poppy environments, that it's important not to attach to it and become what is being sort of thrown back, but it can be useful as far as getting feedback on the things that some people are speaking up about, because there could be others that aren't speaking up about it. And some of those people might be aligned, but then to go and seek counsel, if you care about someone's opinion and you're aligned with them on what their impression of it is. So the noise is just like a canary in the coal mine, but it doesn't mean that there's definitely toxic gas up ahead. Mm. It just means that you've got data and you can choose to work with it if you don't. But people that go to big cities and go to make it and they don't get any of that feedback because it's like almost anonymous, by the time that they've made it, there's now millions of people in some cases aware of them 
And if they've gotten there without the right guidance or they haven't done things as well as they could have, it can be a, a titanic to turn around. Very, very true and very relative point. On the, uh, on the tour, Poppy, I was listening to a podcast with Mark Boris the other day interviewing uh, Charlie Teo, who's one of mm. the world's greatest neurosurgeons, saved countless amount of lives, and um, he unfortunately isn't allowed to operate in Australia anymore due to a multitude of reasons, but one mm, of the main crazy. things was, was tall poppy syndrome and you know how he become, uh, as, as he referred to it, as Bambi, right? You, you never kill Bambi because he was the poster boy of, of you know, that, that industry. <laughs> um, and then the narrative changed because of one way or another and, and you know, he literally is no longer allowed to do his craft. And it, and it made me think about tall poppy syndrome and you know how in Australia, I've never experienced it in, in any other country, we are uh, a nation that likes to be just the average. Everyone, if everyone's the same and we, you know, one person doesn't make us seem you know, maybe less than what we could be, everything's okay. But as soon as there's someone who's doing better, a little bit more provocative, maybe doing things a little bit differently, um, there's certain people out there that you know, want to want to bring us back down to their level. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What, what's your experience been with, with, with tall poppy syndrome? Yeah, um, like it's been, it's kind of been ever present, really. It's more, it's become more noticeable. If I look at my journey, like I, I got into this real estate ecosystem, 04, 05. I was 22 at the time. Uh, I had a high IQ and a, and a fault finding problem solving mentality. And I don't say that to boast, that's just the traits I came in with energy to burn, didn't have kids. Uh, and whilst I'd had relationships in around there, they were you know, supportive of me going ahead. I, um, and I got into a business where, you know, my, my parents were both working for other, for other organizations at the time. And dad came out with me and we started a business from scratch. And he'd had some exposure to the commercial industrial real estate market, was doing quite well in it. We did a little development. Um, process together prior to and I, I had a good awareness of the industry and I probably hustled harder than most others but again that was my that was my Siamese <laughs> fighting fish pond I, I just thought that's how hard it was going to be I know how hard it was when I was involved in music and events trying to get our band ahead but I experienced it in music and events I experienced mm-hmm. it in sport and and I think that you know there's just a thing if you go in the woods you've got to expect mosquitoes but if there's something in the woods that's valuable to you, important to you, or even if you've just got a curiosity to go there and you can, you can prepare yourself for that. And the aero guard for some, for the, for the me now is just coming back to those sort of stoic style beliefs and, and just continually assessing internally in a very honest combo and having coaches and mentors that I can genuinely bounce it off in close to environments. What, what I'm doing is aligned or is what I'm doing aligned, what's important to my bigger picture, which is, you know, my vision is to transform the entire Australian real estate industry and then beyond. And my mission is to solve complex problems that the industry is having, has had trouble up until now, solving for themselves and providing solutions that we implement where we do a lot of the work for them in the businesses I'm involved in. So when it comes to that sort of tall poppy stuff, like if you go in there saying to someone, you've got problems, you're not able to solve it, I'm going to solve it, I'm smarter than you. Like That's, that's obviously an approach that's going to earn you more haters. Hmm. Yeah. And some of those people would have been neutral, and it's not, it's not skeptics that are the issue, it's the cynics. The cynics are of the belief that you know, they're like pessimists, really. A skeptic is someone usually, and they might sit in the C quadrant of a disc analysis where they just need more information as to not just the why, but the how. And so uh, some of those people that become dragged along with the conversations, the hater type stuff that ends up in tall poppy conversations, a lot of the time they would have been happy to understand the the true message. So this is where everything starts to coagulate, particularly, you know, now I've sort of gone through that threshold of the amount of time in business and, you know, sort of eight or so years there, but also doing lots of other stuff with music and that prior and buying and selling properties and stuff, start to realize the little micro lessons that have happened along the way and that to be successful in its own right doesn't always attract haters. If there's someone that believes though that the world is this pie and by someone else doing well, that it must be at this expense versus that 
you know, by definition of abundance, like someone can do well, I can do well, even if it's not purely on that one dollar, that one client, that one year's trading, and that doing well for them might be getting the feedback on how to improve and adapt their own model, especially if they choose to collaborate or influence themselves in similar ways, that the whole thing gets better as a result of it. So does that answer that question? Yeah, it does. And it makes me think about Gary Vaynerchuk's, you know, metaphor around you can build the biggest building in the world by building the biggest building or by tearing someone else's down and mm. probably not having the biggest building if you didn't tear that person's down, but yeah, it's the tallest at that point in time. That, that's obviously now come with 20 years worth of, of, like you said, business experience. But I think for a lot of people, what holds, from what I hear, what holds people back is the fear of judgment of whatever they're doing, right? So mm. whether you're in real estate, whether you're in you know, other sectors of business, whether it's music, most people won't put themselves out there, be their authentic selves. Um, I only think back to when you and I met, you used to wear suits every day, mm. you know, look super professional in, in quotation marks and now today you're in some nice Reeboks and a, and a black t-shirt and this is probably your authentic self more than the suit was. Mate, um, I, I, yeah, I, I remember when I first got involved with a, an online portal for real estate that wanted my industry input and I, and I got heavily involved and it was an amazing product, well built out. It was an exact solution for the time. The, you know, the, the tribe that was involved in it and the backers, like they didn't quite execute perfectly, but it was a great lesson for me, but that's, that's irrelevant. But I walked into the room with some people that I could see were influential and the room was filled with people with t-shirts. The people in business suits were more the lawyers and accountants. And I just thought, oh, wow, it'd be so great to go to work in a t-shirt and sneakers. Not like looking slobby, but looking comfortable. And I thought freedom and creativity. And I think at that time in my life, around that 13, 14, 15, 16, 2000, 13, 14, 15, 16, I had a lot of people in and around my businesses, my client circles or whatever that were still waiting to see if I was going to fail. Mm. And in some ways, almost reaffirming themselves that that would be a flash in the pan and then it would go because, you know, we'd come through, their grandparents had been through the depression, that had affected their parents and the values from their parents at age two to seven have affected their stuff. And, and that's got a lot to do with money beliefs. If you go right back to Australia, founded by convicts and first settlers bringing convicts over here, some of that stuff's deep in there so when i started seeing that freedom and i started seeing that i thought subconsciously i set a bit of a goal to go to work in a t-shirt now over time you know i went to rms instead of polished italian loafers uh, loafer shoes or whatever then i you know and i went from having the fine wool suits to having like a chino that was more flexible just for functional reasons because i was in and out of cars all day then i started wearing a round neck long sleeve t-shirt they still had a jacket over it, which I'd sometimes take off if I was comfortable with the client. And I, and I watched some of the eyebrows in my own company, particularly with the higher value agents that had come from other brands and still had a lot of their own ingrained fear-based behavior going on. And it was, it was quite a journey to get to that point where I could show up, where I've got a trusting tribe, the leadership team, trusting team, like Simon Sonic talks about, uh, Shirley Dalton talks about, and you know have a tribe of people that believe in the vision that have belief in the founder or the owners of the company that you know they know it's expected of them and and they look at that and they see their authentic self coming through i believe i was still uh in alignment with all my business practices always had the client's best interest at heart always had a greater good like an industry improvement sort of angle everything i had i would be sharing internally and for those externally that wanted to hear it but yeah, I, I did find that there was still a disconnect between home and work. I'd get home and I'd work in my suit. Like if I finished work at 10 p.m., I'd wear my suit, maybe minus a jacket until I finished so that when I finished, I've stopped work now. And I'm now in a t-shirt. And, and I just felt that a lot of the time. Now I feel free flowing and it, it just feels right. And if someone still wants to wear a suit to work, that's absolutely fine. But interestingly, when I was still representing properties into that 10 million plus range when I was still like the main listing agent on properties and sort of coming in to give that strategic advice in my later years of direct selling with clients in, in one brand. Um, I started wearing the t-shirts and sneakers to those appointments and I looked around, I thought I'm, I'm dealing with surgeons, neurosurgeons, heart surgeons, all that. I'm dealing with entrepreneurs. I'm dealing with people that are on huge financial planning practices. I'm dealing with like coal miners that have become coal mine owners. 
And I looked around the room, almost never did they have business attire on in their own home. And I think that by me being in this, it's almost like saying at some point, someone's decided that if you show up to that, it means you care enough about the meeting. Someone said to me once that, you know, you want your attire and your haircut and your appearance to be unremarkable so that your the way you act is remarkable, the way you carry yourself is remarkable. And I, I think that's functional. But when, when it got to that point where you just meet someone, you know they're comfortable in their skin, you know there's authenticity there. And, and how that comes through in business and social media and the way you interact with your teams and, and collaborate in the industry that you're in, I think that that emanates a different energy and there's, a, uh, there's an alignment that goes on internally that gives a belief and your vibe starts attracting more of your tribe. Mm. I think it's a, it was a lower percentage. It was a, still a high percentage of vibe attracts your tribe based on what I was doing and the success. But a lot of people joining my companies from the early days were coming on board because they also wanted that success. And I knew that I needed to grow our company, but then you don't know always about their inherent beliefs and the things that are holding them back and what's going to play out and what they do when they're in a fearful or reactionary position. And it was a very energetically draining with culture, a lot of re-explaining of things that they'd already agreed to and their beliefs that they were tangled up with. And I found like, I was trying to control conversations. It was like boxing at shadows. Mm. And, and that comes back to similar things, controlling what you can control. Don't listen to all of the noise. It doesn't mean you're not aware of it. Gary Vee talks about it. He's aware of it. He reads the comments. He sees what his response is to that. He feels like, is it got any truth in relation to my values, vision, mission? If not, okay, nice to know. Sorry to hear about it for you because you know, you don't have to prove them wrong. You've, you've just got to prove yourself to be congruent with what's important to you by focusing again on what's important. Mm, I love that. You just mentioned there around, you know, the, there was a lot of people who jumped on the bandwagon for the success of your businesses. Like to, to, to put context, we obviously in the, in the intro ran through all of the successes you've had and, and to continue to have, but you had a real estate business and still do that's, you know, two to three to four times the size of your closest competitor. Um, in, a, in a marketplace, you know, like Newcastle, Lake Macquarie, um, which is a pretty incredible feat. There wouldn't be any, I don't think, in Sydney, which would be four times the size of their closest competitor. Like none, I don't reckon, in a, in a, in a certain marketplace. Yeah, um, and like... So the what I was going to say is that that didn't just come about, right? Because it was from zero to, mm. to that level. There's obviously, as we, I talk about property growth, it's, you know, constantly a battle like this. You go up 10%, back three, up. 15 back 10 um what what were the biggest challenges that you that you faced you know growing to where you are right now and probably still continue to face but mm -hmm. as you move through the the journey it's probably in a different facet yes um well there's a few some of those are the, the same problems that i'm helping the industry solve now mm -hmm. through the models that i'm building and testing and with with our own funding a lot of the time and you know then if you're using anything to do an expansion or leverage, it's once there's already proof. And I would say that as I transitioned, I was still growing, I was sharing the whole time and I'm grateful for that because that sharing is a gift. If it's a genuine gift, then you don't expect anything back for it. But the law of reciprocity kicks in and the vibe attracts your tribe stuff and the alignment and the law of attraction and all that sort of stuff starts playing out. More people end up coming your way or came my way in that case. As an entrepreneurial owner, so I, I sort of describe myself, I'm an entrepreneur and business is the vehicle I'm driving because you can be entrepreneurial without necessarily being in a commercial business and the brand of business, like the manufacturer of the business I'm in happens to be the real estate industry. So if we boil that down, I became top 0.1% as a sales agent based on my entrepreneurial pursuit of trying to create models that could work in any market for any culturally vision aligned, motivated people that had a willingness and openness, openness to adopt those things rather than say, I've been around forever. I know everyone, I know better than you. These are my techniques because that closed shop mentality, you look at all the industries that have been cracked open that have come from that paywall, firewall, secretary out the front, you know, exclusive, don't share your content with anyone. 
and it's gone the other way to open source and now it's a case of disseminating through that so having that evidence was helpful but i wanted that evidence tried and tested by me with other people and then implemented to others because when you teach something you're really reaching that stage of where you really know it and then when you're reaching mastery you're creating new models that are better than what you've been teaching and you're constantly breaking your own models so uh, for me going through that stage spinning the plate of keeping revenue coming in the door spinning the plate of hiring people and getting them up to speed and front-ending their costs and the risks and the downsides and the mistakes they make spinning the plate of um, competitors bagging out or undercutting on fees or having advertising rates back then in the newspaper we were three thousand three hundred dollars a page and the competitor that had the best rate was a thousand same newspaper you know that old industry has changed now too um, but th those were common things having uh, a talent pool of agents a lot of the people who joined me originally were people that liked my vision passion motivation but hadn't had experience in direct real estate or had a lot of experience in direct real estate and had kind of been discarded or had left another firm for a myriad of reasons but they weren't sort of on the first draft pick you know if you're comparing it to mba coming out of college so having people that had gotten to a fair stage of experience in the industry but still hadn't really made it and getting them there was a lot going on in that world and then you know then the the, the stuff to do it's all poppy kicking in working with family members that had come up through different times with different values and having all those plates spinning i'm very grateful that i was willing to stay the course sometimes it was like you know i'd been past the check power of the point of no return not much choice unless i you know whilst you always have a choice things would have been substantially different in my life mm. i didn't amass a lot of property wealth in that early stage because it was all going back into the business income everything and really just pulling out the bits that i needed to sort of you know live a pretty comfortable life but definitely not sort of what was proportional to what i was bringing in so the spinning of plates i'd say would have been one of the big ones the other things that are coming up with the real estate industry now I've always been able to attract great talent and align people and, and explain where I'm coming from with things. Um, people saying yes without it being a full yes. People agreeing to something and agreeing to an agreement of some sort, written, verbal, otherwise. And then when it's not all going in their favour or they're not finding the success or they're not actually going through with the actions that they would, would show they were truly committed to what they wanted along the way, then sort of staying below the line blame excuses denial and making it my problem and of course me wanting to nurture them grow them and also mindful of what other people thought if i brought on a good agent and they didn't go to greatness not just because of their financial ability but their alignment and their willingness and their behavior traits and whether they're aligned with our values i was trying to make uh well i was trying to effort my way into creating a lot of other people's success so that it would prove all of these models so my my objectives were always far more complex um and bigger picture but with that just comes a, a it's 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 a fairly heavy load after a while right now i'm like well i wouldn't change anything at all that i i do think that um having a greater understanding of how much load you create when you start to get out in front and i heard this from roger rashid the tennis coach if you've heard of him before no. i saw him do, give a talk it was a really intimate talk i was only one of about 12 people in the room and he's the guy who coached leighton hewitt to grand slams and he had a tennis player come his way he was a french guy at the time uh, well he's still a french guy no doubt uh, <laughs> but the, yeah he, he was guy. on the ladder he was probably 35th in the world and he he wanted to meet with him because he'd heard of what he did with leighton hewitt now leighton hewitt um, he talks about weapons, you know, he talks about Kyrgios, for example, the weapons he's got, Songa, the weapons he had, you know, talk, as far as the shots he's got, the height, the advantage, the tenacity. And he said Leighton Hewitt's weapon was his determination, his heart, his drive, his hunger. And he harnessed that. He used to make him do brutal squat sessions, deadlift sessions, go out and play a game against a good um, player before he went on court for a, a match that was of reasonable importance and and so he would use that that building that strength but he met with this french guy and he said what number do you what's your number and he's gone what do you mean what number he's gone what number do you want to be in the world and he goes number one he goes you don't want that and he goes well i don't want that and he goes well right now you come off the court you do like 15 20 minutes of media 
and you go home to your hotel and you might get a couple of people ask for selfies and autographs and then if you are number one, if you get anywhere near number one, you're on the call for another four hours with media when you knock off. Then you get paparazzi, you get people slandering you in the press, you get competing brands that are trying to elevate their player, putting rumors out about you in the media that you've got to deal with. Your family is going to be worried. You're going to have to sack your girlfriend, may have to sack your girlfriend, your best friends. You're probably not going to be able to visit your hometown anymore. You've got to be careful what you're seeing. You don't want number one. And like, so he, he told him to go away for a month and he called him every day for a month. And then in a month he picks up the phone and he goes, um, where have you been? Why haven't you answered my call? I said, I, didn't, I told you to go away for a month and think about things. He goes, well, I called you every day. And he said, yeah, I know. That's the reason why I'm willing to coach you. You know, and, and even that month was nothing compared to try and get someone up into that top 10 in tennis. It's a life commitment if you really are attaching yourself to number one. So I think in various industries, people want to be the Telstra Business Person of the Year or they want to run a certain number of marathons or they want to write, you know, $5 million in gross commission if you're in real estate, for example, or whatever, number one broken firm in wherever. And I think they've got to think about what is it about number one that they want? Because if it means having a sophisticated business that runs smoothly, that's scalable with a full org chart built out, that's not dependent on one individual, runs like clockwork, happiest clients, helping the industry, all that sort of stuff, you can do that at number three or four. You could do that with a better lifestyle at number three, four or five. If you want to be number one, what kind of number one? Whose ranking mm -hmm. is that going to be? And do you accept the consequences along the way there? That was very, very good. A lot of self-reflection in that. What, um, <clears throat> with, with, you know, I'm not sure if you want to be number one or not. That's, that's probably not a question I've asked. <laughs> two, two things on that. Did the French guy become number one? He got like into the top five or something like that and got some serious injuries. But like, you know, it was a, it was a, I only watched that French guy after I'd heard Roger talk. But remember, he started him in the 30s. So incredible feat to get where he Oh, did. huge. And then second on that, which is something that I struggle with consistently, and I'm fucking three years into a business journey, so I couldn't imagine being 30 or 40 years into it, <laughs> is like you just said, it's easy to say that you want to be the best or you know, you want to do this and, and become this before doing it. And and, um, and uh, David Goggins talks about it's easy to say, you know, you, you want greatness when you're in sitting in a warm warm hotel room or in a warm mm. shower going fuck this sounds great but in the, you know when, when the reality of it comes it's very different like how how do you continue to to deal with it and and push forward and you know deal with the tall poppy um it's obviously the the, the purpose and the mission and the, and the drive that you need to have but then there's also the reality of the day-to-day -day basis of like mm. you know it, it becomes depressing it becomes very challenging mentally more usually it's more more challenging internally in your head than it is in real life oh, undoubtedly yeah um how how have you dealt with it and, and from your experience dealing with a lot of these different people how how do they deal with it and continue to get through the yeah I, and i i think you know all of those points and and again i'm pretty verbose as you you've interpreted over time <laughs> so it is what it is that like, I, I think that there's, a, there's a more complex process to setting goals properly than there is to just naming them. You know, like when, when it was a big deal to be a million dollar agent, one million in fees per year for the listeners that don't really sort of um, follow the real estate market closely. It was a really big deal to write a million dollars when I first hit it. Like at the time, the best agents in our whole region, there would have been less than three probably that were writing a million. And you know, I, mean, I, I could get that data third party and talking to them at the time. And I, it was my, it was towards the end of my third year of real estate into my fourth and and at the time the average agent in australia gross commission like uh according to real estate institutes and other research we get hold of was doing about 110 to 125 grand gross per year um and it, it built up more towards about 130 150 not much right so you take it out and you're on sort of a taxi driver sort of like base salary kind of wage which no one's working for in that industry and you know when i went over a million back then you know and in, in my last year of selling the, the the team i'd assembled under me where i was the main listing agent was like over four million in a business that was sort of in eight figure zone and and so million dollar agent podcast comes out great podcast you know tom panos john mcgrath troy malcolm and those guys have done incredible things for the industry and look franchise groups and other stuff like that they've given awards out on gross revenue so i want to write this much and, and then, like, when you boil it down, if, if, if I'm 
speaking with someone that we're in a close relationship with and I'll, and I'll talk about goals, I often defer to Dr. Fred Gross, who's one of my mentors still today. I speak to him really frequently personally and 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 he talks about mooring lines. When you're doing a goal setting process, he uses an eight step process. It's not just the smart goals method. And one of the things is to have a look at what are the potential mooring lines that have come up and actually have a battle plan for dealing with the mooring, mooring lines. Like if you're in the art of war, like Sun Tzu wrote about, and you've got an enemy and there's, you know, or you've got something that you need to do in war, even though that's written from a long time ago, you still got to have a strategy for what happens if there's a counterattack or if there's something that comes up. So you hear people talking about, like you just said, it's easy to do it from the company of your own home, like Goggins said, people that talk about giving up booze when they're drunk. It's, in, it's incredible, but it's also ridiculous. <laughs> people that talk about giving up booze when they've got a hangover the next day, you're like, they haven't even been in a situation where it even seems slightly... And why do they want to give it up? Is it because of health? Is it because of social issues that they do when they're on it? Is it because of the money? Like, and, and when they come back to it, a lot of people are making decisions about what's important based on some sort of layer of external validation or making it. And that's not putting down that financial goals are important because in, in the world we live in, it's an exchange of energy and you can multiply that energy if you get really good at your craft and you can find ways to do it, find verticals to work in. Uh, that to have a look at what is it you want to experience as a result of that goal. And, you know, I, I speak about it a lot, be, do, have. Like, be the person you want to be right now, today. Even if you don't have all of the skills that you've acquired yet, they're still inside you and the capacity to learn them and, and progress. Then you'll be doing the things that person will be doing and then you'll have any definition of success so it's important to that person that you're being rather than have, do, be, which is actually the main goal setting kind of framework that accidentally pops out. And that is when I have this, I'll be doing this and then I'll be happy or successful. So when I have written $1 million, when I have this car, this amount of money, this partner, then I'll be doing great things. I'll be drinking champagne and martinis and offshore on a nice big boat somewhere and I'll be happy, I'll be successful, I'll be envied by others. And if you look at how much external stuff is in there you don't have control over, by, by looking at have as being the most important, it's automatically putting a gap from what you are at now and what you don't have. And that gap there is constant pursuit. This is what people talk about, not enoughness. Some of the world's billionaires, a lot of the world's billionaires are unhappy because they've become successful in the human video game of business or entrepreneurialism or getting ahead. And then, you know, with that just creates more work to go with that. So if it's a means to an end to do the work, to get the money, and then you get the money, but you still got work going on. And if the exit work, you can lose a lot of that identity that you've attached with your own person of being. And they talk about astronaut syndrome, people that do something incredible. They go to the moon or out of space and then they come back and they're not going to get another mission for 10 years. They'll be too old then. Same with Olympians and stuff like that. Unfortunately, particularly with astronauts or people that have returned from a very elite level of service in any profession, and they come back and their next Guernsey is a long way away, if at all. And if they don't find something really meaningful that moves them, pretty much as soon as they get back, they go, can often go into depression. And then they can go into drugs and alcohol and then they can sometimes become suicidal. It's very mm -hmm. sad. But in that goal process, what are the mooring lines? What are the things that are going to come up that are going to be roadblocks? And then have a battle plan for those. So when they come up, you go, I've, I've anticipated this. You're not even reacting. You're not even responding. It's just data. And that data, you've got a game plan and, and it feels good to use that game plan so the obstacle becomes the way. Always got an answer. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's a like. meme. <laughs> and, um, and now you're, you're in a position where you've, you've probably done a lot of the astronaut stuff that you probably set out to do, right? You've become the multi-million dollar agent, built a big business. Um, you know, you can have the cars and stuff if you want them. You don't really want that sort of stuff. What, uh, what's next for, for you and, and the entities? And you, know, you said one of your goals was to, there's a mission. Yeah, so yeah, it's a great question because um, I often wondered when I was uh, looking to other people for who I was going to sort of set as a bit of a, not a comparison as in, am I better than them? It's sort of like what pathway, I know, and I've taken an approach over years, I've often hung out with people that are ahead of me in the business journey or older or just have more life experience. It doesn't mean it's, it's smarter. It's just what's their experience been? How have they approached decisions when they've got to sort of degrees of happiness? And the amount of people that they care about 
their opinion becomes a lot less. And I get it why some people care about the opinion out there because with anxiety, then, you know, what if that plays out and it negatively affects my business and stuff like that? That's real. That's just being careful. But to let it become you and consume you is another thing. So it's probably been about since 2019 I made a commitment and I just had a series of things that I thought was really cyclical that was going on. They were industry things that I hadn't heard any um, changes on and uh, across the principles I admired and everyone was just accepting it as the way it was. And I gave the business, I, I went on a bit of a sabbatical just for a week and I went and saw some mentors who cared about, people that were very successful, like, you know, sort of 10 figures and above sort of stuff. And I started looking at those people and asking them questions about what they did when they got to a stage of financial abundance where the money was still making money for them and they didn't have to work if they didn't want. What are they doing with their time? What did they do next? How did they find joy, validation, or if that was important and what they were applying themselves to. So it was probably 2019 I made that commitment. 2020, COVID year, despite all the challenges going on in the world at the time and, you know, obviously as a human, I was careful of that and, and, and caring of others. But I also saw it as a factory reset for a lot of industries. We all had to pivot at the same time and that's where I thought that genuine, strategic, visionary leaders that have assembled good teams around them with integrators or loyal lieutenants like I've got with Shelley Dalton, our COO, and the Nexa company and others like that, that we could actually really make a difference at that time for a greater good for our own businesses and have an opportunity to lead and really put ourselves to the test. And I was fired up like nothing else before. And, and then I, I set a goal by 40 years old. I'm not going into lounge rooms. I'm not on reactionary phone calls. I'm not listing and selling properties as an income stream that the business depends on. I'll have replaced my income by others within the business, ideally already there rather than having to recruit. But the recruitment happened naturally. I stopped trying to convince people it was great to work here or that you need to come and work here. I started going with attraction, but then better at converting because we opened up more of the doors. All that stuff started changing and I, and I started, you know, I really ramped up the mentoring with Dr. Fred Gross. Um, I started doing more work again with Michael Sheargold and Jeff Jowett and people that have really got me and my objectives and that have been around a lot of other people that had sort of done another 10 years in front of me. And I started getting really clear on what I wanted life to be like from the moment I woke up to when I went, on, went to sleep at night, regardless if it was a weekday or a weekend. And I think that <clears throat> that's where the B comes from. And if I could create that right now without having all these other external metrics that were just like a rainbow that as you got closer, it got further away. And to fill that void and feel abundant right where I was, then I was in a position to create more. And when creativity is flowing through me, I, I just feel so much more agile, so much more of a knowing sense of what's going on. I brought music back into my life. I've, you know, recorded an album. We left the center, the hip hop group that I was in right back, you know, sort of 2000 or 2007 era. We played Groove in the Mill and all that back then on the festival scene. And I took a time out from that because of business. But then I said, I'm a business person now. And I started shutting down all these other things. And, you know, my, my downtime became like really nice dinners with really nice wine with people I liked and cared about. But realistically, it wasn't filling me with energy and replenishing me, whereas now I feel really nourished. So, you know, my, my just cause that sort of Simon Sonic talks about when you talk about vision and start with why, like, I'm in this boat for a reason, you know, like, and the real estate industry has become the ecosystem of Palladium. and there's so much more growth to doing it. And yes, I'm involved in other industries as well. And I've got investments and roles that I play elsewhere that have got limited time constraints on me. But to transform the Australian real estate industry feels really right for me. It's not, it's, it's, not, it's not a slogan. It's not someone else's. There's so many things that we can do to develop the consumer experience, make it a win-win-win for all stakeholders involved in the ecosystem that's been done right, values greater than cost, living above the line, you know, and all these other words that mean something to me on a personal level as well. The amount of people I can help that have been through a hard journey, uh, the amount of people I can help that think they've got a great life but have that inkling that there's probably more out there for them, the professions that we can help grow, the employment we can create, you know, the stability in the Australia's economy even, that, that sort of stuff. Like wealth in Australia is largely real estate in personal basis mm. and the volume that comes through our market is incredible for our population. So if I can do that and then solve complex problems, 
I love solving complex problems, but making them simple to implement and available to those that are appropriate for them. And then they lead the charge and others come along naturally like a, like a sort of comfortable vacuum. So to me, that's really important. And my, a lot of my goals that are in personal life now, they're not just as a result of that. So it's not a have first. When I have transformed the industry, then I'll be doing this. It's implementing those things into my life so that I'm, I'm triple stacking and habit stacking everywhere. But a lot of the stuff is around my family, my personal pursuits, my creativity, languages and travel and experiences and connection and communities like Fitpit, the group I run and the music, like I said, and, and my kids are amazing, Zadie and Cella, my wife is amazing, Natalie. My circle's kind of, it's expanding from a business point of view still but it's coming closer from a friendship point of view. But then I've got these communities that you would happily call each other friends, but you know, we don't need to hang out every day. We don't need to reach out and check in on each other. We don't like need to like the same TV programs or same activities. We've got shared interests and these communities start overlapping. Mm. So, you know, that those goals are changed for me for sure. And the, the main focus now is in obviously using the, the goal and the mission um and what what are the businesses going to be doing as opposed obviously that's the goal is to transform the real estate industry but how what's the how yeah so like well the what and the how like one of the biggest problems that the australian real estate industry has had for many years it's been going circa 200 years now in australia ray white one of the very early ones and they're an incredible organization and, and many others that have been around for times and some that have extinguished but over, since about 2013, 14, 15, around 2015 started changing where the agent became more celebrated than the company. And I don't have any problem with that. There's no doubt that the agent is the personality out in front. And I suppose it was harder for principals to then figure out, well, how we, are, how we can be of relevance to our agents that work for us. And many of them were agents once themselves. And there's, there's generally somewhere between <laughs> like deep depression to to sarcasm, to cynicism, to skepticism, to, oh, well, just resignation to that you're going to bring in good talent that are going to promise that they're going to be with you forever, that are going to say that they'll always be loyal and respect and they're going to sign off on agreements to say things and they're going to appreciate things to a certain point. But now that coaching and training is so agent available, now that the conference circuit is as strong as it is, now that the online channels are as strong as they are, now that great programs like Tom Panos' Real Estate Gym and, and those things are available for agents to get into wherever they are, I think there's a, a wonderful side to that, that everyone has equal opportunity. And I think that principals have been really struggling with the plate spinning. Well, I've now got to replace that agent that's gone somewhere on a do-it-yourself model or to another group and they're being given a front end and a partnership and whatever. And now they can go and be a business person and, you know, uh, on, on paper get more commission out of it or get their own name on the door, get more control, freedom, you know, tribe of supporters behind them. Now, they might work three times harder when they get out because it's now their business. And they might not implement the org chart of HR and compliance and and have an employment center and actually, you know, really help people come into the industry because they're more looking at what, what's the minimum dose I need to do to be really successful. And I don't have any problem with that. We have a model that supports that as well. But then there's like, I believe that the tier one and tier two companies around Australia, and I've got a matrix for that, which I won't go right into, but you know, tier one companies are essentially got all their org chart built out with multi people in it. It's not principal dependent. Multiple offices usually have a large geographic footprint and community footprint, market share footprint, certain number of management, sophistication in their org chart and their structure and how everything's done from every point of view. And those ones in particular are seeing that cycle so much where they're growing people to a certain level, but you know, it's hard to keep cutting that pie up and give someone equity just so that you've got a stronger keep together when they when they when they're getting to that point where they're now as big as an office mm. regardless of who was involved in getting them there there's always a two-way street there and from the consumer's point of view i believe the consumer still deserves to have the option to go with a service that has everything behind it rather than just the stuff that looks good online or that is the minimal admin processing or technology or whatever because that's all very important if you want to run a light model Vern harnish talks about in scaling up and his talks 20 applications, one higher. And then when you get them, you actually deliver on your promises to help grow them. And they are aware of that and they can see that. And the company, I believe companies should be able to provide, so businesses, principals should be able to provide listings to their agents that work there. If you go to a big corporate, like a Jones Lang LaSalle, CB Richard Ellers, a Collier's, like any other Cushman Wakefield, 
those agents eventually developed their own circles of influence that came through working there a lot of the time that maybe they brought them in if they were recruited like you know sort of um, poached but a lot of the time the company is still delivering those people at an institutional level because of the strength of the brand their ability to deliver the banks and organizations need businesses like that on board in sales businesses and property management businesses, it's becoming less and less because the agents are now being marketed by the agent in the business, their mobile number, their email address, their capture forms everywhere, they're doing their own social media, they've got their own prospectors. So it's not a surprise, I don't hate it at all, that an agent's saying, well, what are you doing for your percentage principal? Now the principals know that they're doing a lot because it's, it's, it's so expensive to keep doing things the way they've always done it because their agents want that and look at new models to try and implement and pay for both at the same time, whilst the consumer pressure on fees is going down, the agent's expectation on what they get out of it's going up. There's more things to advertise in, to try out, to do, trainers, coaches, all that sort of stuff. A lot of sales businesses in Australia, particularly tier two and below, are still relying on their principal to sell, and that principal does not get paid like the other agents do as a percentage of the commission or the work that they directly do. And so that model's got to change because it's, it's, it's not a sustainable model. And what could happen is you could see those brands really just disintegrate back to core people and all these little brands open up, which is totally fine if that happens. But I believe then the consumer is missing out because they don't have teams of people dealing with the database. The industry is missing out because the talent pool goes from, yep, you look at proactive, go out there and prospect and find me some listings and then you'll be successful on that measure Whereas, rather than developing all the emotional intelligence traits and having proper HR systems in place and all the stuff that goes with it. So if we can help people attract, retain, grow and retain top talent that's aligned, then they're not scared about placing people that aren't aligned to that brand and they might be totally fine at another brand, no problem. Less tension around that. Then we've got agents that know their businesses providing value for them. So surprisingly enough, if you, if you interview agents on why they left, there'll be some presenting problems. There'll be some below it. But if you go back six months when things were still pretty good, in those quieter months they were having where they've got staff of their own, marketing of their own, all that, and they're not getting a big comm check that month, that's where they start doubting their value. They see the agency is getting this percentage out of a deal and it's in you know negative for that month or quarter. Now, businesses have to draw on their cash reserves all the time when their agents haven't performed to the stated budget and goals that they've got. And I don't hate on that either. That's just planning around that stuff, but it happens regularly in businesses, particularly in changing markets. But if that agent at that time had a consistent flow of company-generated business with systems that helped them win that business, and the business could deliver that service without massive overhead, trial and error, putting on head count, having a fixed overhead for it. And then the client delivery, you know, consumer delivery of that was done really well. Then that would be solving one of the big problems of why agents go. And the ones that do go, they want their own name on the door or whatever, they can do that. So, you know, I'm, I'm only working with very select parts of the industry at the moment because I've, I've been building this model in my own companies, field tested on all manner of market demographics, types of agents, price points, off the plan, houses, rental, all that stuff. Then I've gone to people in the industry that I consider to be VIPs, influencers, tier one, tier two in various areas, work directly with them on a collaborative basis where we're both contributing to the outcome. And it's really, really detailed, refined test and measure. And I would not have been able to do that and still would not be able to do that if I didn't have multiple real estate businesses, particularly ones that I majority own, where it's eight figure revenue and anything that would have been my personal dividends or margins is getting reinvested, redeployed and, and turned into something that can help build this. But I'm so passionate about it, I'm taking the long approach. I'm not just going and telling everyone how good it is and then getting them to line up and then convince them to go with us and then dealing with all those problems. I'm hand picking who we want to deal with. And if it's a hell yes from them, we do business. And, and if it's not, then we deal with the people that we've got. And I believe mm. that that outcome is already in is already underway. Sounds like you've got it all worked out. <laughs> well, I've got a plan that I'm <laughs> I'm working on. Yeah, that's, that I, I'll that's never very, assume that I've arrived. <laughs> very, very good. The obstacle is the way. Um, to wrap up the podcast, one of our closing traditions is we ask each guest for a quote that they live by, just like we started the podcast with, or something that you resonate which uh, resonate with. Sorry. Um, which is obviously what we open the, the next episode up with and ask mm. that guest. So 
for you, Mark, what would you say the quote is that you live by or that you resonate most with that, that comes to mind? Yeah, I would 100% say be, do, have. Definitely. You know, I explained it just earlier that, you know, be like really meditate and marinate on the person you want to be, how you show up, your energy, your health, how you speak to your partner, your friends, people you don't know, people that hate you, people that love you, um, you know, your fitness, like how you apply yourself in everyday life. Then you'll be doing those things that that person would be doing. And you'll have any definition of success that's important to that person you're being rather than the way, uh, uh, the opposite way around. Because if you're waiting for something to have before you're doing the things and then you're going to be happy, be successful, whatever, there's so much external events that need to happen on that. And it also implies that you are lacking something right now, which can give a scarcity mentality, which is the opposite of abundance. There's all sorts of fear-based behaviors that come there. And you're leaving yourself far too open, having a good experience because life can end at any time, like Memento Mori talks about. That uh, that answers the question that I was going to ask next, which is why. So you, <laughs> you've pre-answered that <laughs> question. <laughs> Mate, yeah. thank, you, uh, thank you very much for coming off of Lingo Sundays. I think there's a lot of gold in there. Yeah, thanks very much for the opportunity. I love this studio, by the way, here, Fibon Studios. Is this the one that Mark Burris records in? It is, mate. Mentored Media, that they uh, they run and operate this. Yeah, they've got some great um, collaborative workspaces in there as well, I noticed, and having exposure to that over the years with some of the entrepreneurial groups I'm in, that, that's good value. So, like, great environment. You're doing a great thing with this. I've watched some of your other episodes, and um, I'm, over, I'm super open to comments and feedback as well. Um, you know, save yourself on the hate because it's, it's not going to attach to me too much. But um, they do have. Yeah, they do have. But yeah, if there's anything you'd like to see more of and any of the stuff, then um, just hit me up. I'm sure there'll be some links in your uh, link in bio. Kenny K, thanks so much. <laughs> thanks, guys.